Hi, I'm Dr. Mike Detola, and I'd like to welcome you to Passion for Perfection, a German Obsession. Sponsored by VHF, whose dental and laboratory mills are German designed, engineered, and built. Apple CEO Tim Cook enlisted a German company to design and build all the furnishings for Apple's World Headquarters remodeling project in Cupertino. When asked why he chose a German company, Cook simply said, there is nothing in the world like German craftsmanship. And now it's time for a segment we like to call Germansplaining. Germansplaining is a segment where I, as a non-German, explain to you the essence of the heart and soul of Germany. Would it make more sense if I was doing this because I was German? Well, of course, but then it wouldn't be Germansplaining. Germans are obsessed with cars, or more specifically, driving them, quickly. And there's no better feeling than arriving at the Frankfurt airport and getting into your taxi, which is most likely an E-Class Mercedes, and then having your driver set a personal land speed record for you on the Autobahn on the way to the hotel. Germany does not have a national speed limit, although the faster portions of the Autobahn have advisory speed limits, which are suggestions rather than rules. It was England who actually introduced the first speed limit for a country. It was back in 1861 and it was 10 miles per hour. My great grandfather used to tell me stories about just driving along, minding your own business, when all of a sudden out of nowhere, some maniac would come whizzing by you at 13 miles an hour. Are you trying to get us killed? Speed limits can pop up on the autobound based on local weather and traffic conditions. And since it is Germany, there's an advanced computer that controls the speed limit system. A recent government report showed that on most days, 70% of the Audubon network had no speed limit, 6% had temporary speed limits due to traffic or weather, and 24% had permanent speed limits due to density. Germans take this freedom to go fast very seriously. And you might ask, how could freeways with no speed limits be safe? Germans are great drivers. It's way harder and more expensive to get your license in Germany than in the US and includes first aid training. The Autobahn is built for higher speed traffic with multiple layers of concrete and constant inspections. German cars receive regular thorough inspections from the TUV to ensure they're safe and they won't break down on the road. California freeways are littered with cars that the TUV would have taken from the driver on the spot and immediately crushed it with the driver inside. That last part probably isn't true. So how do you know when it's safe to let all your horsepower go? This symbol. When translated into English, it means limits no longer apply. Sounds like it could be an alternate motto for VHF with their value proposition and open architecture. VHF, limits no longer apply. I'll give you guys that one for free. Now it's time for another installment of Phenomil Now Conversations, huh? Where we get to talk to the leaders in digital dentistry. We are lucky enough today to have as our guest, Dr. John Sorensen. John is a professor of restorative dentistry and the director of the B4T Research Lab at the University of Washington Dental School. John, thank you for taking some time to be with us today. It's great to be here with you, Michael. And you've been nice enough to provide some slides for us as kind of a framework of what we're going to talk about. So I'm going to click onto your first slide. So we can all see it here. And it looks like you've been doing some research on the effect of milling screw access channels and what it does to CAD CAM materials. I didn't know anybody was doing research like this, so thank you for doing it. In fact, when I was going to dental school, dental schools weren't exactly known for cutting edge research. So it's very cool today that schools are the center of some of um, this advanced CAD CAM kind of research. So, so tell me about what you found and how you got interested in drilling these screw access holes on these CAD CAM materials. Yeah, so uh, when we formed the uh, B4 Research Lab, uh, you know, it's a very exciting time. We've got uh, kind of this synergy going on with these modern materials that allow us to do things more rapidly, they're stronger, and then when we combine those with these uh, dental technologies like these new milling machines, uh, it really allows us to uh, accelerate these processes and make them more predictable and truly make a uh, chair side operating system uh, that can work uh, efficiently in a, in a private practice. Um, and so uh, one of the studies that we wanted to do, this was with uh, Dr. Jack Kiesler, is we wanted to look at the potential damage that occurs when you drill the screw access hole uh, or chimney as it's called uh, for the screw retained uh, implant crown. 
It's interesting because when I saw um, these meso blocks, as they're called, the ones that have the screw access hole already in them from the manufacturer, I just assumed it would be too difficult of a process for, let's say, a dentist to do chair side uh, on their own. And, and I know they're definitely more expensive than the typical blocks. Uh, is that what got you interested in seeing whether or not you could actually make that chimney in these materials? Well, and we all had uh, actually this, the same assumption that it had to be done at the factory. Uh, that's what got us started on this whole project. So uh, not that we're looking at uh, it being a total consideration, but the cost of that meso block is about two and a half times as much as it is if you buy the solid block. And so that's why we undertook this project is to see uh, if it would actually work to be able to uh, produce a screw retained uh, crown chair side and have something that would be at the same strength that it would be if you're using the meso block. Well, I'm going to click on to your next slide, and I see that you've got some uh, flexural strengths of some CAD CAM materials. Are these the different materials that you were trying to make the screw access hole go in? And can you tell me what these uh, what these yeah. values mean in terms of doing that? Yeah, indeed they are. So, in any research you have, you want to have a control that you compare the experimental test to. Uh, so, these are a typical three point bend test, looking at flexural strength. Uh, of these uh, ceramic materials. So we have these as the standards, uh, and these are kind of represent a, a range of, of kind of the three major uh, products or ceramic materials available to us in terms of those classifications. And so then if I click on your next slide, it looks like um, we're seeing how you actually went about drilling these holes and, uh, and then measuring what it did to the flexural strength of the materials themselves afterwards. Yes. And so uh, what we did then was to go through the screw access hole drilling process. We had 10 in each group. And then we would section these to create uh, the specimen, as you can see there, that has half of the screw access hole in. And our thinking was, is as you are drilling this hole, you would get cracks or damage radiating out. And when you do the three-point bend test, that uh, unfortunately it favors uh, any defects that you might have in there. So it was the best test that we could do. Uh, and the bottom line of the study was, is that there was no significant difference in the flexural strength uh, of the meso blocks versus when we uh, created uh, with our milling machine, the screw access holes with the, with the Z4 milling machine. Uh, so, um, uh, and also then uh, there was not a significant reduction in the strength of the ceramics from the milling. So. Uh, it demonstrated that we really have minimal damage that occurs during the uh, drilling of this typically most stressful part of the uh, implant crown. Yeah, so I guess regardless of how the manufacturers are making the meso blocks in the factory, um, as long as you're able to prove that you can safely, you know, mill these chimneys yourself through these materials and not, you know, mm -hmm. suffer any uh, significant decrease in strength, that's fantastic. That allows a dentist to simplify the inventory they have on hand and just take the regular blocks and then make those screw access holes through there. And I'm going to click onto your next slide as well. This is another bit of research. This is fantastic that you guys are doing uh, all this research. Tell me uh, about this next project. I think it was another uh, master's thesis looking at the accuracy of some mills. Yeah. Yeah. So this was a really fun study to do. So uh, we've seen introduction of different milling machines, uh, chair side milling machines. And so uh, we compared three different systems. So we looked at the VHF Z4. We looked at the Avaclar PM1, their newer milling machine. And then again, you all want to have a control. So we used their uh, PM7, which is the big industrial laboratory milling machine. And what we wanted to concentrate on was the accuracy of the margins. Uh, and not to get too technical, but basically we would have the CAD design as we can see there in the orange, and then we would go ahead and mill out the crowns. And then with the software, we could then align those in there and measure it with a very high degree of accuracy, plus or minus three microns. We could then measure the discrepancy in the marginal fit. Uh, and I'm happy to say that for uh, all the systems, uh, the accuracy in 3D measurements, what we call RMS values, were actually very good, around 25 microns. 
And we were also very happy to see that the Z4 chair-side milling machine produced a marginal accuracy that was equal to that of the big laboratory milling machine. And then also uh, looking at the damage, again, whenever you're grinding on ceramics, you have the potential to put flaws and cracks into that. And uh, we saw minimal uh, cracks, minimal chips in this. Uh, and uh, again, um, you know, based on our first study where we don't see a reduction in strength of the ceramics from the milling, now we have the other part of the picture here where we have excellent marginal adaptation uh, that I put up against conventional uh, prosthodontic lab procedures any day of the week. Well, that's great to hear, John. And I know dentists are going to be happy to hear that the Z4 could compete with the huge industrial lab type mills. I'm mm -hmm. sure most dentists don't want to have one of those in their office. I see a Z4 sitting right yeah. over, uh, yeah. right over your shoulder. Yeah. It's got, it's got a nice compact, uh, footprint. Um, I know the, you know, there's other mills. I think you've got another one there. That's got a big, huge, separate dedicated vacuum unit that has to go under the desk. Uh, briefly, just give me your overall perception. Uh, it sounds like you've been able to validate the accuracy of the Z4. Is it intuitive? Mm -hmm. um, it sounds like it's definitely precise. It's an open system. What's the most important feature to you that you like about the Z4? Well, I think the best thing about the Z4, and I can't exactly show you here, but if we look at this, it's a five axis uh, VHF uh, S1 milling machine. It's a great machine. The problem is, is you need two things. One, I need this big under the counter vacuum system. Uh, and then uh, that takes up a lot of space. And if we're talking about uh, you know, typically, you you know, a lot of dental offices turn half the closet or half the bathroom into a, a dental lab. Uh, this is something that really makes it a, a desk type, uh, desktop type of situation. Uh, so the other problem with the uh, laboratory milling uh, system is that it has to have a dedicated airline to operate the system. The beauty of the Z4 is it's completely self-contained. I don't have to add anything special to the water. I just use plain old uh, uh, distilled water for that. Uh, and the other part is that there is a built-in computer system that operates the system. So you can, let's say you're over in one operatory, you can design your crown. You don't have to move things around. You can send that uh, the CAD design over to the little computer in the uh, Z4 and then from there, go right to uh, picking out the material you're using, place the block, close the door and fire up the machine. And in about 20 minutes, you can have an implant crown milled out or a conventional crown out of uh, most of the materials that we're working with. Yeah, that's amazing. It's a little accurate powerhouse takes up a little room. We used to joke, you know, you might want to put it in the reception area to impress your patients, but nobody's using reception areas anymore uh, these days. Yeah. But but to your point, m most of what dental offices call a lab is in fact a converted closet. It's kind of an insult to actual laboratory. So the Z4 fits yeah. in well, even if you have minimal space in your office. John, thank you so much for taking some time with us today to share both of these stories and your experiences with the Z4. We really appreciate it. Yeah, my great pleasure to discuss these very exciting developments going on in dentistry. Thank you. Thank you. Passion for Perfection is brought to you by VHF, designed, engineered, and built in Germany. VHF takes their motto seriously, creating perfection. Their obsession with creating the perfect machines, tools, and software is to enable their customers to pursue creating clinical perfection for their patients. Their open system allows you or your dealer to pair your VHF mill with the best scanner for your practice. And by manufacturing their own mills and the tools that go with it themselves, and always including CAM software at no additional cost, VHF allows clinicians to own a state-of-the-art complete CAD CAM system at about half the cost of other popular CAD CAM solutions in the market. Go to VHF.com to see how you can begin creating perfection too. That'll wrap it up for this episode. So on behalf of myself, Practice Passion, and VHF, how about we shut the front door and start milling? <laughs>